So I'm sure by now all of you are aware of the virus outbreak and have seen the stories on the news of stores selling out of toilet paper and canned goods and the media acting like it's the end of the world and whatnot. While I personally think we're going to come out of this okay in the end, I feel like I have to share what's going on in my area right now because I'm seeing some red flags that are pointing to things going south pretty soon. I live on a large forested property in a rather remote part of the state and for the most part we've been doing alright throughout this ordeal because we're pretty distant from the major urban areas. The virus also didn't make it to my state until quite recently so I haven't been that concerned about it. Unfortunately, a few days ago it did make it here and the announcement was made that all schools would be shut down and all public gatherings like sporting events would be suspended indefinitely. Many workplaces, including mine, have also shut down in order to contain the spread. Unfortunately, when the announcement was made, it caused a lot of panic and many people who had cottages or hunting camps in the woods or around the lakes in my area began fleeing the city in order to ride out the supposed end of the world in isolation. My town really can't handle a massive influx of people like this since we only have one small Walmart and a few small grocery stores. Everything sold out pretty quickly and stores were lined up out the door with people trying to get supplies that I guess they weren't able to get before leaving the city. This meant that not only was my town running out of supplies fast, but the likelihood of someone from outside bringing the virus here was very high as there was confirmed cases in the city about an hour from us. I hate grocery shopping and as a result I generally go to the Costco in the nearest city once every month and just load up on as much as I can afford all in one go. This way I don't have to go out shopping as often and as a side effect I also have at least one month's worth of food and supplies in my house at any given time so I was fine and was able to stay out of the mass panic taking place down at the local grocery stores. I hate to say it but I was actually kind of looking forward to a nice peaceful vacation from work where I could just stay home and get a few things done around the property and spend some time with my girlfriend who is also off of work due to the virus. The first night of our self-imposed quarantine, we made pizza and settled down on the couch for a movie marathon. Once we had finished eating, I got up and turned off all the lights in the house, leaving the TV as our only light source. This was our favorite way to watch movies snuggles up under a blanket in the dim glow from the screen. We were about halfway through our second movie when I could see through the window that one of the motion lights on one of the outbuildings had turned on. I ignored it, figuring it was probably just an animal. Sometimes our own horses even trip the motion lights. Then I saw reflections of light on the ceiling that were moving. Okay, our motion lights definitely don't move. Something is definitely outside. I quietly get up and walk towards the front door leaving all the lights off so that I could see outside but no one could see me. I peek out the narrow window beside the front door and see a white Range Rover sitting in the middle of my driveway by the garage. Someone is outside the car messing with the fuel tank I have beside the garage trying to fill up some jerry cans. What they don't realize is that the power to the fuel pump is controlled from inside the garage and there's no way to turn it on from outside so... I figured they'll just give up and leave, but I still keep an eye on them. Unfortunately for me, they notice the electrical conduit leading into the garage and put two and two together and start walking towards the door. I suddenly remember that the door isn't locked and bolt upstairs and grab the shotgun from the safe. I throw the front door open which startles the guy as he's walking back out from the garage. I don't even point the gun at him, but he still freezes. Uh, hey man, I didn't know you were home, he says sheepishly. I just needed some fuel for my generator, that's all. Gas station's closed in town. Without getting too close to him, I politely asked him what kind of generator he had. When he said it was a Honda something or other, I told him that what was in my tank was dyed diesel fuel meant for farm tractors and heavy equipment, and that his generator wouldn't run off of that. I then firmly told him he should leave. He apologized and got back in his car. I might be paranoid, but I gave the fuel tank in the garage a good spray down with some disinfectant the next morning. I also decided that even though I'm pretty sure that guy was just trying to help his family and meant no harm, I should still probably tighten security around here just in case. There are three ways to get onto my property. 
the main driveway that comes in off the paved road and two trails that lead in from dead-end dirt roads at the bottom end of my property. The public road just kind of becomes my property at a certain point and there are signs posted as such. I took the skid steer loader down there and blocked both trails where they met the road with big logs and other brush I found laying around in the woods to really make a point that I didn't want people coming down there. I also shut the gate on my main driveway for probably the first time since it's been installed. Since the gate opens inward, I then use the tracker to place two large round bales up against the back of the gate so that even if someone cut the padlock off the gate, wouldn't be able to open it. My girlfriend laughed at me, calling me a doomsday prepper and saying that I was taking things a bit too far, and to be honest, I probably was overreacting a little bit. That night, which I guess is last night if you're reading this the day it was posted, it wasn't even dark yet and we had another car pull up to our gate. No one got out, they just turned around and left when they saw the barricaded entrance. I had been keeping in touch with my friends and neighbors in the area via daily phone calls and they had all reported similar things of people coming onto their properties trying to obtain extra supplies. At this point, the supply chain to our town is still functioning, however, our tiny Walmart and two or three grocery stores just don't have room to keep enough stuff to meet the demands of everyone panic buying, so I'm not surprised that it's come to this. I wouldn't consider what's happening to be full-blown looting yet, as most of my neighbors have said that the people have just politely asked for anything they could spare and left peacefully. I seem to be the odd one out with my encounter with the man attempting to steal fuel from my tank. Later, after it got dark, my girlfriend and I were settling in for another movie night when my phone rang. It was my neighbor up the road who was rather elderly. He tells me he's having a problem with his well pump and can't get water and was wondering if I could come have a look at it and also bring him a few jugs of water. I knew he didn't leave his house much anymore and I had been the one to get him supplies when all this started happening so I knew he was probably safe from having the virus. I was a little concerned if I had it and didn't know that I would give it to him, since the elderly were the most at risk, but he just shrugged it off saying that I had been there a few days ago so if I had it, he probably did already and that he was old and would likely die soon anyway so he wasn't really worried about a stupid virus named after a terrible beer. Well I couldn't argue with that logic, so I got a few big jugs of water for him collected a few tools and after moving my hay bale barricade and then locking the gate behind us, my girlfriend and I set off for the neighbor's place. We gave him the jugs of water and I got his well pump working again and it was actually just a leaky pipe causing it to lose water pressure and we headed back home. Once I had parked my truck and I had put the hay bales back in the place blocking the gates, I went to put my tools back in the garage when I noticed something odd about the fuel tank. I walked over to it and realized that someone had removed the filler cap and had stuck what appeared to be a hand-operated bilge pump from a boat inside the tank to try and siphon out some fuel. There were a couple of jerry cans left near the tank as well and they were all empty. This led me to a worrying conclusion. Whoever this was had likely seen us drive in and had run off to hide somewhere in a hurry and they probably weren't too far off. I yelled out into the night that whoever was out there better get off of my property or there would be consequences. I heard someone run through the trees behind the garage and the sound slowly faded away. I removed the pump from my fuel tank and closed the filler cap. I took the jerry cans and pump and just tossed them over my front gate and went inside locking all the doors. My girlfriend and I watched one more movie and then went to bed. The next morning when we woke up, we took the ATVs and did a quick perimeter check of the property. The pump and jerry cans I had tossed over the gate were gone. They had come back and retrieved them some time in the night. We also found tire tracks leading up to one of the log barricades on the lower trails and a bunch of footprints indicating that they had tried to move some of the brush but then gave up and just climbed over and walked in on foot. I know these incidents are minor, however, if People have already resorted to trying to steal things and the situation hasn't even gotten that bad yet. I'm genuinely concerned for what's to come. I'm not trying to add to the panic by sharing this, however, I do want to stress that everyone needs to be careful during these uncertain times.
Now, I'm not a big fan of Uber. Random people picking you up sounds like a bad idea waiting to happen, and this experience only confirms my problems. I work as a bartender in the UK at a pretty popular bar. I always take cabs to and from work, so I don't have a car. One night was extremely busy and cabs were coming and going with people, so many that I couldn't get a hold of one. Desperate, I downloaded Uber and found a driver two minutes from me. He arrived and I attempted to open the back door, but it was locked. I looked at the driver, who signaled for me to open the front passenger door. I found it odd he wanted me sitting right next to him, but I assumed that he had a bunch of stuff in the back. Reluctantly, I got into the passenger seat. The man had a thick Russian accent. Part of me considered just speaking Russian to him, but looking back on it now, I'm glad I kept that ace up my sleeve. Where are you going? He asked in an aggressive way as if I was wasting his time. I told him the address, he plugged it in, and we were on our way. Now usually in these stories, the kidnapper starts following the route and then goes off track once your guard is down. This guy took the first wrong turn he could. Um, this isn't the way. Can you please turn around? I begged. I, I know shortcut, he said. Except he didn't. I saw his phone, and his turn added four minutes to the drive time. Just then, his phone started ringing with the idea saying, Liova K. He picked up the phone, and that's when I heard the most horrifying call in my life. Now to translate, they said, Yes, yes, she's in the car. She suspects nothing. Prep the chains. I'll be there in ten. Make sure everything is ready. We can't leave any remains. We were too sloppy last time. He said all of this in Russian, assuming I couldn't understand. To this day, sometimes I wish I didn't. Now I knew I had less than ten minutes to get out of this situation or I doubt I'd be seen. We were approaching a stoplight. I had to quickly formulate a plan. The door was locked, but it was one of those button locks you could pull out to unlock the door. There was a risk of the man being armed, but I didn't have a choice. Another problem was that we had entered a bad neighborhood, one that was dangerous for a young woman walking alone at night to be in. I decided that after escaping, I would have to order another Uber and pray it was safe. The light turned yellow, then green, and as the car was moving forward, I pulled the button and leapt out of the car. Hey, get back in here! The driver yelled, but... I was already running. I didn't expect to hear footsteps behind me, but when I turned back, the driver was chasing after me. He just ditched his car and came after me. I turned down an alley and hid behind a rubbish bin. I heard him run past the alley. I waited for what seemed like hours until I heard his footsteps again run past the alley entrance. I left the alley and looked back down the street. The car was gone, but my nerves weren't any better. I was still in a bad neighborhood. I was about to call for another Uber when I wisened up. He was probably expecting I'd do that. He was probably on his phone waiting for the alert. So I trekked home. I made the whole two hour walk home. I was lucky enough not to encounter any trouble in that way and as soon as I was back home, I broke down crying. I lived alone so I didn't feel safe one bit. The Uber driver still had my address. I called the police and gave them the description of the man and the make of his car. They attempted to utilize Uber and my pickup history to match the driver with my description, and it turned out that my original driver was supposed to be a woman in a completely different vehicle. In my ridiculous haste, I saw the Uber light and didn't even think to check my app and like a classic horror story idiot, I didn't get the license plate either, so they couldn't do much, but they said they would send an officer to the area. A few weeks later, I had the urge to check the internet to see if anything had been done about my complaint. I came across an article on a Jane Doe found dead by a riverside, her hands chained and a bullet in her skull. The man, not my Uber driver, charged with the crime, told the police of a man named Leova Casanova, who led the entire gang. 
Nothing ever came up about Leova, though. I decided not to come forward with what I knew. I just wanted to return to my life. It's been three years since then, and I've been able to move on with my life. I'm happily married now, now manage my own bar, and have twins coming in a few months. For everyone out there who uses Uber, I won't tell you not to use the app because I made a huge mistake that night not double checking the driver with what it said in the app itself, even though I haven't used it since that night, but I will tell you to make sure you have the driver's license plate, his description, the make of his car, and always make sure he stays on route. It may seem like a long and hard process, but it may just save your life. And to the Uber driver who wanted to turn me into another Jane Doe, I pray we never meet again. I now have the means to defend myself, and if we do meet, I promise only one of us is leaving the encounter alive. I have to begin this before the day I was stalked. I was sleeping on my parents' couch when I had a really strange dream. The dream consisted of a few strange things. I was dreaming that I was sleeping on the same couch I was actually asleep on when I woke up, in the dream, to the slam of a car door outside. Thinking my parents came home late at night, I looked outside. I saw one of the strangest, most demonic creatures hobbling across my front yard. I felt really uncomfortable, so I rushed down my hallway to get my phone and my brother's gun. The next thing I heard was a huge thud on the front door. I started loading the gun and looked out the peephole. All I saw was fur reflecting in the light. It was the creature trying to break down the door and kill me. I couldn't remember where, but I read three words that still scare me to this day. I'm watching you. I then woke up for real with my heart racing. I then heard a car door shut and I looked outside. It was just my mom. I told her about the dream and she then told me she had to go to JCPenney. I decided to go with her just because of how scared I was. I then went shopping with my mom and I decided to look at the men's department. As I was looking at some different ties and shirts, I noticed a man watching me. He then quickly looked away while picking up a random item within his reach. I didn't think much of it, but he decided to look back in a few minutes. As I looked back, I noticed that he looked away from me really quickly like before. I had to go to the bathroom, but I felt a little uncomfortable. I decided to suck it up and go just thinking I was being paranoid. I had gone to the bathroom and did my business. The man then walked in and walked up to a urinal. I got a bad feeling in my gut, then looked back at him while washing my hands. He was watching me. Then he noticed I was looking at him. He smiled at me like I was his next meal or something. I had started to walk out of the bathroom and he quickly zipped up and started after me. I ran to the end of the aisle and just started looking at other things. I then see the man start to look at some things near me. I walked over a couple of aisles. The whole time the man was not far behind. The man seemed to be in his late 60s or early 70s and I was around 9 or 10. I had heard different stories of people kidnapping kids and it freaked me out. But after being followed, I ran out of the store and hid in a nearby store watching the door. After a while, I decided to find my mom. I was watching everywhere around myself and finally found her in the J.C. Penney. I freaked her out when I found her. I then remember the words I read somewhere in the dream of that morning. I'm watching you. After that, I've never seen that guy again, but sometimes I'm reminded of him, and I think back to that time and feel strange. I'm 20 now, but the memory of that day just scares me sometimes. Was it somehow related to my dream? Maybe. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's my story, and the lesson is this. Please watch your surroundings at all times. You never know what people are thinking, or what they're capable of doing. This happened during the summer of 2008. For context, I'm a gay male and 
At that time, I was in a relationship. We'll call my then-boyfriend Mark for privacy reasons. Mark was 35 and I was 30. It was July 4th weekend and my boyfriend wanted to go camping, as he always has every July 4th, usually going with his ex-wife and son, who was 7. However, since he is now out of the closet, he wants to take me with him. A little about me, I'm definitely not an outdoor kind of person. I don't like dirt, I don't like bugs or wild animals, and the thought of not having running water or a roof over my head terrifies me. You know, I'm spoiled rotten. As reluctant as I was, Mark persuaded me to go and reassured me that this would be a weekend to remember. Well, he didn't know how right he was. He told me we would be leaving Friday morning, which was the 4th, and would come back Monday morning. As we both lived in San Jose, California, the nearest place to camp would be the Santa Cruz Mountains near Felton and Big Basin Boulder Creek vicinity. We were going to go off map in a more secluded area to experience nature and less people. We headed out Friday morning around 7 a.m. It was about a 45 minute to an hour drive. On the car ride there, Mark told me about these people that supposedly live in the mountains. First thought that popped in my head was wrong turn and the hills have eyes. I told him that and he chuckled and said no, but there are some similarities. He explained in great detail that these people were uncivilized, not socialized, and unlike the rest of us in society and could possibly be dangerous if we encountered one of them. They basically live like cavemen and are inbred. Yes, they very well might be. He told me, even though he has never come across any of them, he knows they exist and has even been told by his brother that they do indeed exist. Having just heard this, I flipped and told him it's a good thing you just sprung this on me now because you and I both know I would not have come along with you knowing this information. He explained, I'm just letting you know not to frighten you but to inform you if anything should happen but nothing will happen, I guarantee it. Oh really, I said, and how can you possibly guarantee me that? I always come prepared, he said. If you don't believe me, then open my glove compartment, he said, pointing to the glove box. I did as he asked and opened the glove compartment. Inside, I noticed a leather case. I pulled it out. What's this? Fearing what I already suspected it was. I opened it and right before my eyes was a revolver. A gun, basically. I don't know what kind or anything. All I know it was is a black gun. This is your guarantee, I suppose, right? I told him. Yes, you must have known on some level that I wouldn't take us out in the middle of nowhere and not have us protected, he said. I guess maybe in the back of my mind I thought, yeah, but seeing it now makes me feel very uncomfortable, I said. Then also knowing that there is a chance of something happening for you to even bring that gun makes me even more scared than anything else, I said. He didn't respond. He took his hand off the steering wheel and grabbed my hand and held it tight. He looked over at me and said... I won't let anything happen to you. This weekend is for us to enjoy each other's company and that's what it will be. You'll see, he said. He did a good job of reassuring me because I didn't think about the gun again. We reached our destination not too long after that. All around me was just nature. Trees and trees, branches, rocks and boulders everywhere. You could barely see the sky from all the trees blocking out the sunlight. We began to unload everything from his Toyota. I was impressed by what he had brought. A two-bedroom tent, a king-size airbed, and a portable generator with three outlets to run power off of. Wow, I said. Maybe this won't be so bad. He smirked that smirk that I loved. Now that I think about it, I think it was more of an arrogant smirk. Well, my cell doesn't get any service whatsoever and was basically useless and I did use it as my mp3 player. Smartphones were just starting to make their way available to us but I had my Motorola KRZR then and was ready for the upgrade. Mark said, yeah well I need the power because I do have to get some work done this weekend as he pulled out his laptop from the back seat. What am I supposed to do, go play outside while you're working I said? Don't be like that. I've seen all the books, magazines, and your Nintendo DS, so you obviously had ways to occupy your time as well, he said. He was right. I did bring things to entertain myself and was absolutely delighted that I could enjoy them longer with the help of portable electricity. 
Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were uneventful. We took hikes, made campfires, took naps, relaxed, and barbecued. I did actually enjoy myself. That is, until Sunday night. We were in bed. Mark was asleep and I was reading R.L. Stein, Fear Street Book. Yes, I know, but I love those books. I thought I heard something in the distance. Now I was kind of used to the little noises of animals like chipmunks and squirrels running around through the leaves, but this sounded more distinct. Footsteps, not that of a four-legged animal, it sounded more like a human, like someone was trying to walk as quietly as possible. No, no, I thought, it's just my imagination from reading this book. I set the book down and started to strain to hear more. Closer, whatever it is, it's getting closer. A bear, maybe. I looked over at Mark, who was sound asleep. Contemplating what to do, the footsteps reached the tent. Right above our heads was a zippered screen window that we had zipped closed and... That was where whatever it was outside had stopped. I held my breath. All I could hear was my rapidly beating heartbeat. I heard someone else breathing. Not Mark. Whoever it was outside. I wanted to wake Mark up, but I knew if I did, he would make some kind of noise and that would alert whoever it was out there that we were awake. That was when I heard a click. I know that sound. It's the same click sound when I open up my pocket knife. Oh my god, I thought. This is it. This is where I'm going to perish. Mark, I thought. I knew this was a bad idea. That's when I heard a scraping sound run across the tent. I knew what they were doing. They were running that knife all around the tent, taunting us. I knew this person had to know one of us was awake. Why else would they be doing that? The sound of the blade went all along the side of the tent and came back around to where we were, then started again. It was then I nudged Mark to wake up. Mark, I whispered. He started to groan, what, and I said, shh, please. I whispered, there's someone outside. I couldn't see his face or anything for that matter because I had turned off the reading light. There's someone outside, I whispered, look. I then saw a flashlight shining on the tent. Mark reached over to the side of the bed, grabbed his case, and pulled out the revolver. He yelled, Stop! Whoever's out there, I have a gun, and I'll not hesitate to shoot you in the face. Leave now or I will. The flashlight switched off, and whoever it was started to walk away. Not even a speed walk, just casually walking away, and without any light, it was completely pitch black out. Mark held onto that gun as I lay there in horror. Silence. Nothing. We didn't say a word, just listening for any kind of sound. Somehow in all the chaos I must have fell asleep because I woke up to Mark shouting my name to come outside. I rubbed my eyes and looked at my watch. It was 6.15am and it was already light outside. I darted up and ran outside to see what he was yelling about. I ran to him to see him kneeling down by his tires. Slashed. I looked at the other ones and they were too slashed. The driver's side and passenger side window had been shattered. Oh my god, I shouted. What are we going to do now? Mark grabbed my hand and said we're going to walk back to the main highway as fast as we can before whoever did this comes back. My wallet, I cried. I need my wallet, my keys, and my phone. My phone was still in the tent inside the bag. I rushed over to the tent, grabbed my messenger bag, realizing, oh wait, my wallet and keys are in the glove box. Oh god, I said the glove box, I ran over to the Toyota, swung open the door and noticed the glove box was torn open and everything gone. I started to cry, realizing that this situation is too much for me to deal with. My heart sank into my stomach and my knees got weak, I felt like I was going to faint. Mark, they have my driver's license, my house key, my money, and bank cards, I cried. Mark yelled so loud I heard his echo in the distance. Let's go now, he said. It's only about a mile and a half to the highway. We're going to have to flag someone down or find a call box since my phone is dead, he said. Don't say that word, I told him. Weak and scared, I started walking with him down the dirt road. 
we drove just a couple of days prior. As we walked, I could sense that there was someone or something else near us. I had this feeling of being watched. Oh no, I thought. Please let us get out of here in one piece. Mark, I said. He stopped me, putting his finger to his lips and said, I know. I don't think we're alone. I can hear leaves crunching. I think we're being followed. Just keep moving and know what I told you on the way here. I mean it. I'll do whatever I have to protect us. I won't let anything happen to you. Thank goodness for that gun, I thought, but I wish we weren't in this predicament to begin with. Speed walking got me tired and thirsty. Then I could hear cars in the distance. We were almost there, I said. Yeah, we're just a little more. Finally reaching the highway, I pulled out my phone and I had signal. Not much battery, but just enough for us to call the police, and Mark did call the police. They were there in less than five minutes. Two patrol cars arrived. Mark explained everything while I sat on the curb. I was questioned about the events and said all my identification and cards were stolen in my house and car keys. The officer told me to cancel all those cards immediately and have my house locks changed ASAP. He suggested also to have the vehicle's locks changed. Two more officers arrived, taking Mark and I back to the camp. I really didn't want to go, but having the police with us, I felt somewhat safe. Mark had called his insurance and was expecting a tow truck there soon. When we arrived, three of the officers looked around and took pictures and questioned us more and sealed off the area with yellow tape. Made it look like a crime scene, which I guess it was because a crime did take place there. The officers asked Mark and I if we had any idea who or why someone would do this. I said no, and furthermore, I didn't tell anyone besides my mother and best friend that I was coming, but I didn't say where. Mark said he only told his ex-wife, who was at home with their son. I thought maybe her, because she obviously didn't like me and the feeling was mutual. I brushed that thought out of my mind because it was almost impossible for her to pull it off. Also, Mark and I got together way after they were divorced. It wasn't like I broke them up and turned them out. All her rage at him was then directed at me, but she didn't scare me and I could handle her and didn't see her as a threat. The officer explained to us that it was most likely an isolated incident and it could have been someone who most likely didn't agree with our alternative lifestyle. Big surprise, I thought, but even this was extreme and I wasn't really buying that load of nonsense the officer was telling us. Seemed like he knew more than he was willing to tell us. So what's going to happen now, I said. The officer told me, well, we have your information and report. We will investigate and we'll search for fingerprints or any other evidence. If and when we come up with any leads, we'll let you know. You might have to testify against any culprits we apprehend. And until then, he said, get all your locks changed, cancel your credit cards, and let us know if you come up with any new information. Great, I thought. So that's it. The officer couldn't give us any more information as to who or why this happened. About ten minutes later, the tow truck arrived. We gathered all of our belongings. I was confused that nothing in the tent was stolen, not even Mark's laptop. Now, if I let my imagination run wild, I could think of other things that didn't make sense, but I didn't want to go down that path. On the way back to the city, I was so much in disbelief. I wanted to say to Mark, I told you so, but... He looked so hurt and confused I couldn't do it. Plus, it sucked to be right. I mean, I really did want to enjoy myself this weekend and it started out pretty good. I got home immediately, cancelled everything, had my mom call the locksmith and changed all the house locks. I made an appointment for my car to get the locks changed and left it in the garage. I was still tense just knowing someone had my address and keys. Even though they couldn't unlock our house door, that wouldn't stop them from breaking in. Nothing ever came of the situation, or if it did, Mark never informed me of it. We spoke about it and he was constantly checking in with the police department. He bought a new SUV, he didn't want any kind of reminder of that weekend, and I agreed on that. We broke up a few months later for other reasons. I always wondered if he ever went camping again after that, or if he ever regretted that weekend. As for me, it's been 12 years since that horrible weekend. I now live in a different state where people do camp a lot. Good for them. I haven't camped since then and I never will again.
Growing up, I spent a great deal of my childhood with my grandparents. They were travelers of different lines. My grandma being an Irish traveler and my grandfather being of Romani descent, despite being born and bred in Ireland. I was staying with my grandparents during the Easter break. My granddad's mother, Leonora, was still alive and kicking, around 90 years old. She was the monarch of the family, outliving her spouse and siblings by almost 25 years. For an elderly lady, she was incredibly tough as she was still physically able to walk unaided and get around. I called her Nora, which is what I still refer to her as in the story. My days would start with porridge for breakfast, followed by hours of playing outside no matter the weather, eventually coming back to the trailer to spend the evening helping Nora cook. She would tell me stories of her childhood and plait my hair. After we had eaten, my grandmother would put me to bed. After a while, Nora would come and sit on my bed and stroke my head. What I didn't know at the time was that Nora would place and replace stones around my bed and window sill to come back and remove them before I woke, and I would never have nightmares. Around the tenth day, things went as usual. I was put to bed and Nora came to place the stones. This is the night I had the most vivid, terrifying dream I've ever experienced, which woke me up. Upon waking, I saw the stones. I picked one up to investigate. As I retrieved it, something in the hallway caught my eye. I looked out to the hallway and saw Nora, but she appeared cloudy and translucent. She turned her head to look at me, smiled, and proceeded to move down the hallway. She wasn't walking, however, it was more like a gliding-like motion. Despite being awoken by a nightmare, I felt calm. Still clutching the stone, I got out of bed to follow her down the hallway. As I passed her room, her door was closed as it usually was when she slept. I reached out to open it, but my hand would not touch the door no matter how hard I tried. I just couldn't touch it. Frustrated and sleepy, I headed back down the hallway to my room to go back into bed. I placed the stone back where it was before I picked it up. I slept the remainder of the night peacefully. At one point, I felt Nora stroking my hair. When I woke up in the morning, Nora's door was still closed. I was greeted in the hall by my granddad who took me to the kitchen. He sat me at the table with my grandma and cousins as my grandfather explained to us that Nora had gone away and we won't see her again for a very long time. Later in life it became clear to me that me not being able to open the door was Nora's way of protecting me from seeing something damaging to a young child, and for that... I am grateful. I have quite a lot of stories such as this, all dating back to my teen years. In this story I am remembering a day where I luckily dodged a bullet. I was a rather attractive 17 year old with shoulder long black hair and an edgy attitude. I was staying at my dad's who lived in Stockholm and had decided to go outside to enjoy the rain. It was going on 10pm or so. As I was standing there, a taxi pulled up and a man and woman exited. The woman, after having said goodbye to her, I assumed friend, left down the street. The man, however, going on 40-something, walked up to the apartment door that me and my dad lived in. He stopped and looked at me, his attitude friendly and relaxed. Why are you standing out here in the rain? He asked. I like the rain, I replied, thinking I was quite cool for the fact. Yeah, it was that age. Come, you'll catch a cold, he said after a little chuckle and opened the door. I followed in and we shared the stairs on the way up where he asked how old I was. I told him 17 and he appraised me from head to toe and said with surprise that he thought I was older. Again, being that age, I was nothing but flattered. All teens want to be adults after all, or the very least appear it. I laughed anyway, and we continued up the stairs when he gets a strange idea. Ever seen Stockholm from the roof? No, I said, intrigued but also apprehensive. It was raining, so the idea of walking the roof didn't make sense in my head, but... 
Being a bit of a stupid thrill seeker, I obliged with a smile. He led me all the way up until we reached the apartment attic. He turned around and grinned at me, which at the time I thought was only innocent. We make it to the roof anyway, and he holds my hand so I won't fall. The view is amazing, and it's not raining so much anymore. We walk around there, keeping balance, until eventually he helps me back downstairs into the attic. We continue to innocently talk until we make it to where he lives, a few stairs down, and this is where my alarm bells really went off. Want to come inside? He asked, standing there outside of his door. I was stunned by the question, because he knew how old I was, and while legal in Sweden, it's still creepy considering our age difference. Realistically, there is only one thing a man could possibly want with a 17-year-old girl he quite obviously found attractive. Um, I stammered, still taken aback by the question. I have a friend over. We can watch TV and eat pizza. A friend? I can't tell if that makes it worse or more secure. No, thank you, I politely replied and made it towards my dad's door, which was ironically right next to the man's. You live there? He asked, pointing at my dad's door, and he said his name. Yeah, that's my dad. I answered with a proud smile as I made my way over there. He looked a bit more on the fence now, a strange wary look in his eye as he opened his door. All right, well, tell him I said hello. We said our goodbyes and I told my dad what happened. He looked angry but didn't tell me whether or not he'd do something about it. Knowing my dad today, though, he probably had a stern talk with this man. Since I visited my dad quite rarely, I thankfully never bumped into this man again. I don't like to use the word ghosts to describe specific paranormal activity. However, I like to use the word as a blanket term. I truly believe that there are things in this world which influence us with an invisible eye and most are willing to ignore the fact by being blissfully unaware. But there are a few who can see through the veil and are forced to believe otherwise. I am one of those lucky or maybe unlucky people that have seen enough to not ignore its existence. I could probably talk all day about why some people are chosen to see through the veil, but I'm not here to talk about that. For a long while, I've been listening to ghost stories on YouTube that have been narrated and it never fails to fascinate me. I've had the idea to type out my ghost stories but failed to make them entertaining enough to be read out. Hopefully this will be different. My story begins when I was a young boy. I'm 23 now but don't remember how old I was when this happened. Just know it was a while ago. I believe my family and I were in Arizona. The house that this occurred at was a big house. My dad has always liked big houses and preferred them over anything else. The moment you open the front door, you see an angled wall that went left to a rather sizable area that eventually led to an even bigger living room. Maybe I'm being overdramatic with this, but could be because I was small. Directly to the right of the front door was just a wall and to the left was a big window that led to a curved staircase that went to the right. Right underneath the top of the stairs was a bathroom that was a Jack and Jill styled bathroom. One room was for the toilet, then the other room was a sink that then opened to the large front room. That's about how much you need to know in order to fully understand the story so I won't be indulging in any more about the house. It was a typical evening and we decided to go out to eat. Being that we didn't get to do this often, I was excited and got ready as fast as I could. Because of that, I was the first to be ready, and seeing as I was impatient, I ran downstairs to the front door to wait for the rest of my family who were still upstairs getting ready. I don't recall how long I sat there for, but at some point I began to have a funny feeling. At the time, I didn't know how to explain my feeling, but I now know that it was the feeling of dread. I thought I was just too anxious and put the feeling aside, even though it was a strong feeling. However, while I was minding my business, trying my best to be patient, I heard long, drawn-out breathing coming from the back of the unlit bathroom. This freaked me out so much that I was thrown off guard and tried making logical reasons on why I was hearing this. My first reason was that maybe someone had gone down the stairs and was trying to scare me. 
but I quickly threw that reason out because I had seen no one come down the stairs due to the fact that I was staring at them for the majority of the time. My second reason was that it was one of my parents' friends trying to scare me, but that idea was quickly thrown out as well because I was right next to the door. Then whatever was in the bathroom, it began to take slow and heavy steps towards the entrance of the bathroom. It sounded as if the thing was stomping or weighed 200 tons as each footstep echoed out from the bathroom. I got too scared to move, but at the same time I was driven mad with curiosity on what exactly was making the noise. So, I waited in anticipation as this thing walked slowly towards the entrance of the bathroom. It then stopped midway and turned the sink on. I could clearly hear the sounds of someone washing their hands. Keep in mind that the heavy and drawn out breathing continued. I then got enough courage to say something to see what would happen. I said, Hello? Is someone there? To my dismay, it shut off the faucet and continued to walk around. As it did, the breathing became louder and louder to the point that it sounded like someone was loudly breathing in my ear. At that point, I was too scared and ran up the stairs while loosely covering my ears. I never dared to look in the direction of the bathroom, but noticed the footsteps had stopped. It didn't chase me up the stairs, and as I neared the room where everyone was getting ready, I slowed my breathing and entered. Everyone was still getting ready. I didn't feel like being by myself anymore for that day and decided to stay with the rest of my family until we finally went out to eat. And before you ask, no, I didn't bring up the incident with my family because I didn't think they'd believe me. Fortunately, I didn't have a whole lot of encounters with this thing, but it did freak me out one more time before we moved. Oddly enough, it happened at night around the same time as the first encounter. I was playing with toys with my two brothers in the massive living room when I had the idea of getting another toy to add to the plot of whatever we were playing. The toy that I had in mind was in my room that I shared with my brothers, so I eagerly run up the stairs and began to approach the room. I didn't find this odd at the time, but the room light was on. I just thought maybe someone left it on, but I paid no mind to it at all. Maybe when I was ten feet away from the room, the light turned off. The door had suddenly went from fully open to ajar as if someone were peeking out, and to my absolute horror, was accompanied with the same drawn-out breathing coming from the room. I wisely chose to turn and run back down rather than face whatever it was that was blocking me from my toy. When I got back, I gave my brothers an excuse that I couldn't find the toy. Thankfully, nothing else happened. When we finally moved, we went to Colorado... My dad rented a small home that barely fit the big family, a ranch style, I believe. We didn't stay in that house for more than five years, but we eventually moved again. But not before facing another ghost that seemed to target my brothers and I. We even got to see what it was. Now, I don't particularly remember the layout of that house, but I do know that the room that me and my brothers shared had a big window that faced the backyard. And that is where we saw this other ghost. The encounter with this thing, though, stands out from the rest of my ghost encounters. On this said night, me and my brothers were in bed just talking to each other in the dark about elementary kid stuff. I was talking about something when I noticed my twin brother staring behind me at the window with the look of pure terror. That was when I saw my oldest brother looking at the same direction. He too had the same look. With my eyes wild, I quickly turned around to see a child-sized shadow person standing at the window looking in on us. Nothing really stood out except the milky white eyes that glowed. I immediately had the impression of hate, death, and decay. Weirdly enough, we didn't scream but ran out as fast as we could out of that room with our blankets and pillows. On that night, we decided to sleep in the hallway with the room closed for two months until we were forced to move back into our room. My brothers thankfully never saw that thing again, but I would see it one more time. The last time I saw it was not as scary, but more interesting. I remember that it happened in a winter season because there was snow. I was told by my father to bring out a trash bag to the trash bin that was in the backyard against the wall. I gleefully took the trash and hopped my way to the back gate. I opened it to see the same shadow child looking in our room as before. 
I tried to study the situation, but before I could do that, it turned and ran from the window in the opposite direction and vanished halfway through the yard. Curiosity got the best of me, and I threw the trash in the bin and promptly went over to the place I'd seen it stand. I saw two footprints in the snow where it had been standing and saw the trail that it had made before disappearing for good. Something strange is going on in my town. I'm an 18-year-old male. I consider myself a very athletic guy, maybe because I do a lot of sports. I live in a small town in the state of Texas. It's not much going on here. So one night I was walking my dog out in the woods behind our house when suddenly the night sky turned very bright orange on the horizon. At first I thought I was looking into a sunset, but then I remembered that it was already past midnight. Then the sky went back to normal and repeated that process two more times, before it disappeared as fast as it had happened. I then felt pretty sick and immediately started to walk back home, dragging my poor dog behind me. After I arrived back home, I told everyone, expecting them to have seen it as well, but nobody did so. I thought this was a bit odd. The same night, I woke up at 5am to helicopters flying over my house. I stepped outside onto our porch... The choppers flew really low but had no lights, so they were almost impossible to locate. There were at least four of them. The night after, I saw more choppers after I heard a strange noise from our main road in our town, almost like an animal type of scream, but I can't replace it with any animal I know around here. Nothing more occurred after that. A thing I noticed later was it was completely silent during the lights in the sky, almost like everything had stopped breathing. So that kind of discounts it being any sort of explosion or something of that sort. I have a few theories, but to this day I don't know what I encountered that night. I'm a fresh teacher board passer last 2018. After getting my license, I was asked by a friend to become a substitute teacher in a nearby school for him, since he's going to be gone for a month. I happily accepted and started the next week after. So the class that I was going to be substituting was for grade 7. I was quite nervous to start, but the first day went well. However, on the night of my first day, my friend texted me. Hey Bree, um, I forgot to tell you about one of my students. Anyway, his name is George. He's kind of weird and he might intimidate you, but don't worry, he's harmless. He just needs a little attention and guidance. By the way, thank you so much. Hope you have fun. Well, that's what he said. I was now aware of who the George kid was. He was small, wore glasses, and was sitting at the back. His classmates were kind of mean to him, I must say. So I decided to be kind to him and to approach him since my friend told me he needed guidance and I wanted to help. Hi George, I'm Miss Bree. How was your day today? I started the conversation while the rest of the students were leaving the room. Uh, good, he replied shyly. Well, if you need any help, I'd be glad to assist you. I'm now your new friend, alright? I said. Oh, okay, thanks, he said and we parted ways. I didn't know that with that simple conversation, everything would change. George started to smile at me, not the cute smile, nor the innocent smile, but the smile that would send chills to your spine. I always smiled back, anyways, since the teacher should be friendly. Random letters appeared on my desk in the faculty room with a similar handwriting like George's, stating weird and very sensitive things about him, like how he does things to pleasure himself, how he likes to stalk his classmates, and more. He didn't sign the letters, but the handwriting was unique, and I just know it was his. I ignored it, which made it worse. I started to receive the same letters in my house, someone ringing the doorbell at 3 a.m. for one whole week, my tires getting slashed, random accounts sending hate on my social media, my windows being smashed, and a lot more. I decided to let my friend, whom I substituted for, know all the things that had been happening. He was very alarmed and told me to report it to the principal as soon as possible, 
and so I did. George was called into the guidance office and was suspended for a week. I was not able to hear what he had to say as my friend already came back and was attending the class again. My friend shared everything to me, though. Apparently me ignoring the letters made George upset. He felt like I lied to him about being his friend, and so he started doing these things to me to get his revenge. His parents visited me one day and apologized. I accepted it, told them to get help for their son. So to George, I'm sorry I didn't understand you, but please don't do this to your teachers. I would highly appreciate it if you get guidance and help. You're a smart kid, and you still deserve to be treated nicely since you clearly need help. Now all these events destroyed me and my love for teaching. I decided to have a fresh start in a new state and took therapy while I looked for a new job, specifically not teaching for now. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.